Welcome. My name is Marie, and it's the second quarter of the Teens Cornerstone Connection Lesson 2023. Going through Lesson 1, we have Baraka on the mission story. In the orchestra, we have Lee and George on the saxophone, Sakai on the trumpet, Subira on the clarinet, Amy, Seth, and I on the violin. Lastly, we have the lesson panel being done by some of the Nairobi Central teens, along with their teen teachers. Enjoy! Happy Sabbath, viewers. My name is Baraka, and I'll be taking us through the mission story. The mission story for the second quarter of this year will come from the Inter-European Division, which cons consists of 20 countries, such as Austria, Belgium, France, Romania, and Portugal. Our first story, entitled Daria Goes to Kindergarten, will be coming from the country of Romania. Some interesting facts about Romania are, Romania contains the heaviest building in the world, which is the Palace of Parliament in Budapest, which is the capital of Romania. Romania was the first communist country to ever win the European Cup, and at the moment contains approximately 80,000 Seventh-day Adventists. It was a big day for three-year-old Daria, as it was her first time going to kindergarten. Um, she put on her favorite clothes and shoes and was very excited to be going to kindergarten. When she arrived, she was nervous and scared at first because it was a new environment and new people, and she didn't really know anyone yet. However, after two days, she had fully acclimatized and began interacting with the other children, and she began to really enjoy it. After some time, Daria's mother began to notice changes in her behavior at home. She was more clean, she would wash her hands before eating, which was previously something she had to be forced to do. She began to pray before every meal, which was something they never did in their household. Um, Daria's mother was surprised at first, but pleased to see that the kindergarten she had taken her daughter to was changing her daughter in a positive way and making her develop good habits. Um, in Romania, they have a, between kindergarten and first grade, they have zero grade, where children go and they basically are taught to read and write before they can join first grade. When Daria went to zero grade, she was the only child in the entire grade who was able to read and write which surprised all her teachers. And upon inquiry, they discovered that it was all because of the special Seventh-day Adventist kindergarten that Daria had attended. The, thir the 13th Sabbath offering will go to creating, um, creating more schools in Romania and opening an after-school program for children like Daria where they can go and learn about God and learn to pray as well as be taught to read and write. We'll now say a short prayer for children like Daria so that the mission in Romania can continue to bless people. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the good work that our offerings do throughout the world. We pray that the 13th Sabbath offering may impact more and more children like Daria and help them know more about you and learn about your word. This is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen.
Hello and welcome to our panel discussion for the lesson for today. We are beginning a new quarter and the title of the first lesson is Life is Hard Work. Work. And before we begin, I'd like to introduce the fellow panelists on the set. And I'll start from my extreme left. Please introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Sabira Kundi, and I'm a member of Teens Class. And hello, my name is Ashley Silas, and I'm a member of Teens Class as well. Happy Sabbath. My name is Misati Nyambane. And I'm your moderator for today. My name is Nico Opio. And before we begin, I'd like to invite Sabira to give us the opening prayer. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for giving us this wonderful opportunity to come on Sabbath and learn more about you. The title of today's lesson is Life is Hard, Work. Let us learn the importance of work in our lives for teens and of all ages throughout life. I pray that today may be meaningful and people online as well as people with us today may learn key lessons. In Jesus' name I pray and believe, amen. Amen. So the thing is, there are actually things in life which are difficult to do. So I'd like to throw it to each one of you. What is something that you would never have done or even imagine doing if it were not for someone who forced you to do it or circumstances that made it so? So I'll start from you, Nico. Tell us. Okay, so there's something I did once which I don't think I'll ever do again. Um... One time we were required to distribute some flyers and I was walking around somewhere in the city and distributing some flyers to people because we were trying to promote an evangelistic campaign that we had. And I actually ended up getting caught and I was locked up like in a cell for a few minutes or hours as I was waiting for someone to come. The reason is the authorities required that all the flyers needed to have stamps and I didn't know this. So I was kind of like the sacrificial lamb. So if you told me to do that again, I I wouldn't do it again. I'll go second. I definitely think um, bungee jumping. Guys, do not do this ever, especially because I fear heights extensively. And this opportunity, my friend invited me for me to go and do bungee jumping, but I was super shocked and she really forced me to do it because I reached there and I thought it was some sort of other activity and we ended up doing this really scary thing. So I wouldn't have done it if I wasn't forced, but that lesson, that experience taught me a key lesson that I can face my fears regardless. Well, I wouldn't be a first, but if circumstances hadn't led to it and if I had to choose, I'd never be a first. But. For me, it would be going to boarding school while in high school. It was a whole new experience. The transition was hard. Coming from home, a loving family, going into a new environment, trying to transition. And it was not just about reading uh, while I was in primary school. In high school, it was different. You had to read and you had to do a whole lot of manual work. Right. In the morning, you'd wake up early, you'd have your morning, um, morning duties. And even in the evening, it was hard work. Eventually, it turned out to be well. But if you told me to go back and start high school, I probably wouldn't have done it. Yeah. And to just cap it off, something that I would never, I would never do again is what, inordinately reading when I was younger. That is, I sacrificed my social life in order for me to read because I was locked up in the house. I was an inmate of sorts. I was under house arrest when I was younger. For good reasons, I Mm -hmm. now come to realize, but I was under house arrest. I would never do that again, actually. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think as teenagers, we have to balance our lives. And like you said, you being under house arrest in your own house with people having excessive social lives and also excessive work, work, work lives. So there needs to be a good balance. Yeah, I think when we think about all these jobs that we've ever done in life, it comes out clearly to us that there are always going to be things that you'd love to definitely do again. And there are other things that even if you paid all the money in the world, you wouldn't do. 
I, I don't know about you, but if I'm given, say, a million shillings to do a job, would you still not do it again? If it was bungee jumping or going back to boarding, maybe it can motivate you a bit to do it. But as we look at the theme for today where life is hard, we'd want to look at a story in the Bible where someone was forced to do something that he didn't like. And this will be from the book of Genesis chapter 39 and all the way to chapter 41. And I'd like Subira to give us a summary of this story so that we can understand the consequences or the circumstances under which life was hard and Joseph had to work. Right. And the title of today's story is Life is Hard, Work. So the Lord was with Joseph and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. He said, with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he's entrusted to my care. Therefore, my master really, really trusts me, so I can't let him down. How could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? When his master heard the false story that his wife told him, she said, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger, and Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place in which the king's prisoners were confined. After a while, they've been in custody and everything, and each of the two men, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. So Joseph told them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all of his officials. He lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. Now he restored the chief cupbearer so that he would put Pharaoh's cup into his hand, but he impaled the chief baker just as Joseph had said in his interpretation. So two full years passed by and Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile and seven cows came up from the river, sleek and fat. Now, after them came seven other cows, ugly and gaunt. They came up and stood beside those on the river bank. Unfortunately, the seven ugly and gaunt cows ate up the sleek, fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. So Joseph said, Pharaoh's dreams are all in the same. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good heads of grain are also seven years. Now the seven lean and ugly cows are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. These are seven years of famine. Then Pharaoh said, since God gave you all this information, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only in respect to the throne am I greater than you. And that's basically it. Well, but there's some quick questions I think we can get from this. So first question, where do you see God's hand in the story? What do you think, teacher Nico? Well, I see God's hand in several places. Um, it's not very easy to be sold into slavery. And then you go into slavery, end up again as head of Potiphar's house. And after going to head Potiphar's house, you're taken back to prison. And eventually you get out of prison and become the chief uh, vizier of Egypt. I think that's a very key thing that happened there. So God actually leads even when we have adverse circumstances in our lives. Even when we think that God is not there for us, we see that God was always leading Joseph. Like it's him who decided to give the king the dream two years after he'd been put in prison, when Joseph was thinking that he had already been forgotten. So I believe God is the one who put the dream so that he could remember that, oh, Joseph is in prison and I know that someone can interpret dreams. Indeed. What do you think, Ms. Ati? Actually, what I think is where I'm seeing God's hand in this is that even though it seems to Joseph and to the readers mm -hmm. 
when we be first read it, is that Joseph was going from bad to worse. I'm realizing that he was going from better to best. Why is that? Because first he's thrown in a pit, okay, that's not very glamorous, but then now he's put in Potiphar's house, that is, he's the chief of the guard. So in essence, Joseph was moving from the tents of his fathers to the palace. He was moving closer to the palace. That is, now he was moving to Potiphar's house, which was, of course, close to the palace, that is, and from Potiphar's house, he was being handed over to the, the king's prison. And the king's prison isn't where common war criminals are kept, no. This is a place which is where the king feels comfortable to throw men who he trusts a lot. That is, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. So I'm realizing that he's now taken to the king's prison. He's close to the palace. And once he's in the king's prison and has risen through the ranks to the point where he was, at the same point where he was in Potiphar's house, he's now entrusted to the kingdom. So through all these years, I can see God preparing Joseph for life in the palace. Right. Okay. So you touched on really what Joseph, this is Joseph's journey, right? So another question I'd like to pose to you guys, what made Joseph succeed so often in the tasks in which he undertook? What do you think, Ashley? Joseph and Joseph, Joseph succeed, did succeed in the task he took because of one thing. He learned, he learned to do that which was his duty and not incline to his inclinations, not do that which he felt like doing. And he was faithful in that which was least, and so he was entrusted with much. Right. What do you think, Teacher Daniel? Yeah, two things. Um, I like how Joseph moved from the pit to the prison and to the palace, three Ps. Mm. And two things that I pick out that helped Joseph to succeed in all that he was uh, given to do. Number one, he was industrious. He was disciplined. Mm. Yeah. And uh, the second thing is that God actually blessed him because of his faithfulness. Mm. Yeah. So um, you find that when he was uh, in the the house of the chief, he was picked out among the other slaves and he was able to be educated and given favor because of his industry. So this, uh, his industry and God's blessing, I think were able, enabled him to be able to succeed in all that he was able to do. Right, and really important, right? In life, we can be having this beautiful coat of many colors and move on to our pit and our downfalls, but all of this is a preparation. So whatever you do, God has a plan for you, regardless, plan for good and to give you hope for the future. Amen. Thank you, Subira, for elaborating on that story. And uh, even before we continue, we'd like to have a short break. I hope you're enjoying the lesson so far. We'll have a short item of music before we continue digging deeper into this story. Remember, the title is Life is Hard Work.
Welcome back. Thank you, orchestra team, for the wonderful item of music. That is hymn number 375 from our SDA hymnal, Work for the Night is Coming. There's a time that will reach when there'll be no more work to be done. And just as we are seeing throughout the story, we've seen that it is important for us to work even when we have a chance because there's a time when we might not be able to work. We might be put in prison like Joseph. We might be sold by our brothers. We might die under unfortunate circumstances. So God actually just says, work, 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 for the night is coming. Misati, I'd like you to take us through the key text that we had for this lesson, life is hard, work. So our key texts are the words of Pharaoh. This is Pharaoh saying to Joseph that, in as much as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. So in these words of Pharaoh, what I am seeing here is that Pharaoh identifies positive traits in Joseph based on those few minutes that he was with Joseph. I'd like to note that. In that Pharaoh was not hearing hearsay, that he placed Joseph before him, and Sir Joseph is discerning. Sir Joseph is wise and said, I will place you to rule over my house. In essence, Pharaoh had placed Joseph as the head of Egypt. But now, to placate his ego, he said, you know what? In regards to the throne, I will be greater than you, but we know you are the brain of this superpower. Amen, amen. I love the way that is actually brought out where it's like Joseph is literally second in command to Pharaoh. No one else is greater than him. It's no wonder his brothers were even surprised when they came to Egypt, but that's a story for another day. But he was in a high, high position. Even no Egyptian had ever ascended to the throne to that magnitude. And looking further into this, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I believe this was the motto and theme that Joseph kept up with in his life to the point of elevation that he received under Pharaoh. Maybe, Ashley, you can enlighten us on this more. Yeah, you know, the interesting part about this text is that our labor is not in vain. You know, it doesn't specify what, 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 what kind of work you do, what position you occupy. It just says that your labor is not in vain. You know, whatever you, it is you're doing, whether you're reading your books or you're standing in the kitchen and doing the dishes, your labor is not in vain. As I said earlier, the faithfulness of Joseph, the, the little things which he did made him learn to deal with the great things. In his entire life, he was the beloved of his father. He, he just experienced tenderness and the love of his father. But from when he was taken from his father's tent to the pit, back to Potiphar's house, those few hours of his life taught him what he would not learn in an entire lifetime if he did not go through that experience. So God was glorified by the faithfulness of his servant, and it was his purpose that in purity and uprightness, the believer in God should appear in marked contrast to the worshippers of idols, that thus the light of heavenly grace might shine forth amid the darkness of heathenism. As Mr. Tihar has said, in a few minutes of spending time in the presence of Pharaoh, Pharaoh had already seen that Joseph was a man of discernment. So the question I'd like to pose to each one of us is, in our life, how does our faithfulness affect the people in our circles? By the things we do and how we live our life, how does it affect the view of God? 
how do people view God by seeing us and how faithful we are? Yeah, I think I, with that, uh, in regards to that question, definitely as you two have really emphasized that Pharaoh got to see these beautiful qualities of Joseph. And from this, he's determined that in a political sphere, you can have this power within Egypt, right? And furthermore, saying that his discernment and his wisdom is coming in from God, right? Because God has given him this wonderful gift to interpret dreams. And therefore, as Pharaoh did, he didn't really believe in God as much, but he believed in what Joseph could do. And Joseph could do what he could do because he believed in God. Therefore, in our lives today as teens, in an evangelical aspect, we can go out and lead Christ-like lives. And in this, many people, our teachers and our friends, can see the way we live our life and aspire to be like us. And therefore, we can attribute that the way we live is directed by God. And on this matter, I, I want to add something else that Pharaoh mentions, is that he says that in Joseph are the spirits of the holy gods. Okay, so Egypt was a polytheistic nation. But now for Pharaoh to say that within Joseph are the spirit of the holy gods, he was in essence ascending Joseph to the throne of a Pharaoh. That is, because they believed that the Pharaoh was an embodiment of Ra, the sun god. And that is, so in essence, what Pharaoh was saying is, you have the power to become another Pharaoh. You, in essence, are what? Are the leader. But now we must maintain a semblance of power. And that is, you must stand behind me, for I am the one who has been the invested with this authority. But you, you, Joseph, are the one who is making the difference here. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the nice points on that. And as we go on, I'd like us to highlight some of the key texts and punchlines that we loved from the punchline section. And I'd like to give each and every one of you an opportunity to actually share which was the verse that spoke most to you. What was it that appealed to you and could you tell everyone why this was the case? Yes, we can start with you, Donna. Thank you. And throughout the lesson, we find very um, many verses that talk about work, our, that encourage us uh, to work, and also that tell us what are the advantages and what should be our attitude towards work. So what stood out for me was actually 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And it says, uh, Beloved, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because your labor is not in vain. Indeed, our labor is not in vain, whether it's at home or at school, and even importantly, in the work of God, our labor is not in vain. Amen. Um, a verse that really stuck to me, was stuck out to me, sorry, was Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 and 16, and it says, do everything without grumbling or arguing, and then I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that it did not run or labor in vain. This is still adding on to your wonderful point, um, but the first section is really important. Do everything without grumbling. As teenagers and honestly as humans, work is not easy. Life is hard and therefore we must work, but this work is not a breeze. No one really enjoys going to school or waking up every day in the morning to go to work, but it is essential for our well-being. Therefore, in everything that you do, do it with a smile and be happy to engage in work and reap what you sow because when you work, there are benefits, of course. So as teens class, let's say if your mom tells you to make your bed, do it with pride and happiness. And sometimes it's hard, but you can do it. Amen. Um, a verse that spoke up to me is Proverbs fourteen twenty three that says, all hard work brings a profit, but mere talks lead only to poverty. Other versions say idle charter brings poverty. You know, we talk a lot. I mean, it's whether we are talking, chatting, you know, whatever it is we do, we communicate a lot. But the question is, 
what we say, does it bring profit to our lives or not? Is it idle chatter or mere talk? What are we talking about and how valuable is what we are talking about to us? And what impression does it leave upon us? Yeah. And for myself, I want to emphasize Proverbs 14.23 by adding another proverb to it. That is, a word in season is like apples of gold in settings of silver. So I think there's a clear distinction between, an, between idle chatter and a word in season. So in essence, what we should always do is our conversation should always be seasoned with grace that it may ennoble the hearer. But now idle chatter is just saying something but never actually effecting that which is said. And by a word in season, a word in season is always matched with the action. That is Right. And I think there are three types of people in this world, right? So... There are people who can talk, like say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to become like the best runner in my school. I'm going to get an A in every single class. And then there's the dreamers who really emphasize that talk, but simply sit down and say, oh, I wish I was this. I wish I was this. And then there's the doers, people who actually go ahead, com combine their talk and their dreams and turn it into something of reality. So it's really important, whatever we want to do, some of us want to go to college or want to have wonderful jobs and be rich. Well, you can dream all about it in your seat and at school, but it's important for you to act out and act on it. Amen. So it actually means instead of talking, we should work. We put our money where our mouth is. Yeah, because life is hard. We can talk and talk and talk and it won't actually make any sense at the end of the day. We have to show the efforts that we've put in advance for that. So I'd like to share my key text, which I found was very nice for me. It's Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7, where the Bible says, For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knows thy walking through this great wilderness. These 40 years the Lord thy God hath been with thee, and thou hast lacked nothing. Now the Bible says the Lord our God has blessed the work of our hands. If we do not work, there'll be nothing for the Lord to bless because there's nothing which we've actually gone to do and worked for it. So what does God have to bless? So if we want God to bless the little we have, then we have to do a lot with the little we have. In fact, Luke 16 verse 10 says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in that which is a lot. So if we are faithful with the little that we have, God will bless it. That's even why if you remember the parable of the talents, the person who said that he just kept his talent because he had one talent actually got punishment because he did not use his talent as the Lord wanted him to use it. Now I'd like us to start focusing on the theme of how faithfulness is actually a commitment. Because uh, Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So Ashley, could you speak more to faithfulness being a commitment? We want to be faithful like Joseph, but is this really something easy that we just get up and say, I'm going to do this? Because talking is easy. How do we actually get ourselves to work? Well, easier said than done. We were saying that says, you know, it's easier to give up than stay committed. Mm -hmm. And that is how difficult commitment is. You know, you, you literally, yes, I want to do this. But getting yourself out of bed is a task, yeah. So faithfulness is a committed and is a commitment, and it is something. Once you're committed to do something, you do it regardless how you feel. Whether you feel like it, you don't feel like it. You feel like waking up, you don't feel like waking up. You feel like this is so tiresome. Lord, do I have to do it? You still have to do it because those little things teach you to manage greater things and those little things is what makes shows who you are mm -hmm. joseph was kind and compassionate he was sorrowful in the prison but because he made it a point in his life to encourage those prisoners he was not drowned in his sorrows but he was lifted as he was he, he was 
He was lifted above his troubles and has lightened the sorrows of others. You know, we all dream to, you know, come from grass to grace. But as we are given more responsibility, comes a reason or more temptation. You see, when I was younger, there were things that were not temptations to me. I couldn't go to the club. I mean, it didn't even cross my mind. But mm. this age, I have the option. My friends are going and they text me and say, you know, as you grow older, there are temptations that would not, that would not bother you when you are younger. There's a quote in Patriarchs and Prophets, page, chapter 21, that says, um, chapter 20, sorry, that says, just as the tempest leaves unharmed the lowly flower of the valley while it uproots the stately tree upon the mountain top, so those who maintain integrity in humble life may be dragged down to the pit by the temptations that, are, that assail worldly success and honor. Joseph was a lowly man, humble. He lived a humble life. You can imagine being put in a state of worldly success and honor, what did this, what kind of temptations did this bring his way? He was chief um, servant in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife was there to assail him. Temptations that assail the people in, in, in lofty in a lofty seat, would not assail me, who is living a humble life. And you know, the higher you are, the greater you fall. So if you fall from somewhere that is, if you're on a flyover, and if I'm on the ground, if I sleep and fall on the ground, and if you sleep and fall all the way from the flyover, who'll get hurt? So one cannot stand upon a lofty height without danger. And... One thing that encourages us, even as we, you know, seek to have, to be this people in society, to stand on the lofty pinnacles of the earth, is that the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil, that is understanding. If this is our motto, we will stand in the lofty pinnacles of the earth, and the temptations that are sailing we shall overcome, because Christ is our strength. Amen, amen. Thank you for that. Faithfulness has to be something that we are committed to. I don't know if you struggle with waking up. Is it eating at the wrong time? Is it going for the exercise that you know you really need for the whole week? Those are some of the things that we may be struggling with. Is it even just finishing your assignments in good time? God is saying we need to be faithful in the little things. I'd like us to read from the book of Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 to 16 where the Bible says, do all things without murmuring and disputing or complaining, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. This verse is actually telling us that when we do things without murmuring or complaining like Joseph and stay faithful, then when Christ comes, we'll be harmless and blameless. Nobody will ever say anything against us. When Joseph was in prison, we don't see any record of anybody bringing an accusation from him, about him, right? And we also don't see anyone talking in a negative way about Joseph, except his brothers. And the reason was because he was faithful. He's told to do something, he goes to them, and they actually complain. So it's Joseph's brothers that were complaining about him and eventually ended up selling him into slavery. But it's not because of what Joseph hadn't done or something that he had done to offend them, except just telling them what God had done for him. Even before we come to the end of this lesson, I'd like to ask Richard Donner to share with us some interesting facts about Joseph. Indeed, um, the story of Joseph has taught us quite a bit. 
two things I want to share with us that we learned when we were preparing for this lesson is that when the Pharaoh actually changed Joseph's name to Zaphenath Pioneer when he promoted him as a high official in Egypt. Now this name is um, it's an Egyptian name that means revealer of secret. Can you imagine the Pharaoh who was an idolater or someone who worships idols was able to see something special about Joseph. He was a revealer of secrets. And not only so, he was able to recognize that actually the Lord or the God that Joseph worships is the one true God. So this has taught us that through our life and our character and even through our actions, people might actually see us and uh, we may reveal God through these other people to these other people through what we do and what we proclaim. The other thing is that these wonderful and beautiful monuments uh, in ancient Egypt were actually built by the slaves from Israel. So we get that as much as uh, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, they didn't grumble, but they worked hard. And we can even see a result of their hard work even today. Up to date, the wonderful buildings that have stood uh, the test of time in Egypt were built by these slaves. So they didn't take uh, any thought into their hard circumstances, but they worked hard. And we see that their labor has folded them because all we can do is just, you know, uh, admire the magnificent buildings in Egypt. So wherever you are, just work hard. You never know where your works will do. Yeah, and definitely like revealer of secrets. Okay, because God gave him the permission to um, this wonderful gift of, like you said, interpreting dreams. So that's revealing the wonderful secrets. And also, we learn later on in our lessons, because of what you do, the way Joseph worked so hard, and he was faithful, of course, to God, he was able to come into this wonderful position and eventually helped his family out. So whoever you're with, always be kind and never grumble in mm -hmm. any way and be willing to work and serve. And I'd like to add one more thing. Um, the modesty and uprightness of Joseph proved his innocence when his master's wife accused him. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if Potiphar believed that Joseph had tried to do what his wife said, he would have had him killed. I mean, that is insolence, mm. you know. He would, have tried, he would have had him killed, but because he saw how Joseph was faithful in his work, all he needed to do was protect the honor of his home. So by that, he put him in the king's prison, where he knew he'd be safe, and he would even come out at a given point. So our uprightness, the modesty and uprightness that had uniformly characterized his conduct to approve of his innocence. May that be our experience. Yeah, and Amen. to cap it a bit is I, I want us to just, I, I just imagine that Potiphar's wife must have heard of Joseph's appointment. That is. And I believe that was the ultimate what, yeah, comeback for Joseph. <laughs> that was the ultimate comeback that as Potiphar's wife was offering herself like, see, this is, I want to give you this thing. I want you to give you this thing. Then Joseph turned her down. This was the ultimate comeback because of all honesty, whatever, whatever Potiphar's wife wanted to grant him, he got it and he got it without guilt, without shame. And at the same time, he was given who? If you go back to the history, he was given a virgin. That is Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of, of On. So I think in essence, if we come to the end or at that point, it was like, hey, this is a nice comeback. So, of course, God knows how to infuse a little humor into our lives if we allow him. Well, yeah, it could Amen. be called humor. But really, people are looking every single day to put us down. And Potter's, Potiphar's wife is really just representation of all these little voices. There are people maybe in school who really don't want you to succeed. People in the work who don't really want you to get a promotion. They're fighting. There are so many people trying to achieve their own agendas, selfishly, of course. But it is important to know that if you stay faithful and to God for everything that you do and you work tirelessly, God will reward you in his right time. Amen. Amen.
This just reminds me of uh, Matthew 5, verse 16, where it says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. When I look at Joseph, I see a light shining in a dark place. Regardless of the things that were going on in Egypt, Joseph's light was shining bright. So it's an encouragement to all the teens. Keep your light shining. I think the motto we normally have is be the change you that want you want to, to see. I believe Joseph was that change in his time. So we'd like to do the fundamental belief which is growing in Christ. This is the 11th fundamental belief of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we actually believe that growth in Christ is a process. As a baby is born, they don't start walking. They start by crawling. Their teeth normally are not yet out. The teeth grow slowly. And eventually they come out as milk teeth before they get permanent teeth at a later time. And this is what God actually calls us to do in our growth process with him. When Christ came into this world, Christ died on the cross. And this really did something big for us because he gained and conquered the forces of evil in this world. And as human beings, we were bound to the chains of sin that Satan had held us in for a while. But Christ came and said, no more to the demonic forces that were existing in the world. So as a result of that, Christ told us, I leave you the Holy Spirit to help you with all the challenges with sin that you have. And as a result of this, each and every one of us has a personal experience where we can actually grow in Christ by daily reading the word of God, joining together in church worship, singing with fellow believers, we have a chance at growing. But Christ said, it's not only about what you say or think that you're doing, you also have to show others that I am present in your life, just like Joseph did. So over and above our personal relationship with God, we have to do acts of kindness, like visiting, visiting the sick, ministering to others, and helping those who have needs around us. This actually shows the evidence of our growth in Christ. Mm -hmm. And as a result of this growth, God can say, well done, good and faithful servant, because we've actually done the things that Christ did. And Christ lives in our hearts and dwells with us as a result. Mm -hmm. So we believe that growth is something that has to happen. We may eventually or we may initially start as babies, but eventually we'll be adults in the word of God and we'll be working just as Christ did. And Christ's character will be our character. And we've seen that clearly in the life of Joseph. So it is our prayer that as we continue with this study, you may understand the lessons that God has for us. Next week, we'll be talking about the desert drama. I mean, not the desert drama, the could you do it? And the theme of the lesson is desert drama. And the title for next week is, could you do it? Please stay tuned, join us once more, and may God bless you as you consider and ponder over the lessons we've had today. Happy and blessed Sabbath. Let's pray. Creator of the universe, thank you for the lesson that you have prepared for us, that we have learned and understood that faithfulness is a commitment and you can help us grow in you with baby steps as we come along and learn to be perfect in your sight as you are perfect. Our Father, we pray that these things, as we learn them, we may put them into practice in our daily living that they may not be in vain, and even as we labor for you, we may not, it may not be in vain, that when you come, we might rejoice in seeing your face. Be with us, take care of us, and bless us, for this is a humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.